So actually, I'm going to talk about lipid droplets, which are um, very peculiar organelles in the cells because they are, this, they are an organelle that is not surrounded by a membrane, but instead by a, by a uh, phospholipid monolayer. And um, a lot of proteins have to localize to lipid droplets, and a lot of them use an amphitheater helix to, to target lipid droplets. So what you want to understand is why a protein goes to lipid droplet, not to, a, to another organelle that's surrounded by a bilayer. And so um, in order to answer this question, so I started looking at this protein, protein family called the perilipins, which are really like hallmark mammalian lipid droplet proteins. So there is um, three perilipins that have been studied a lot. They localize to lipid droplets. And all of them, they contain in their sequence a predicted amphitheater helix region. But there's, um, <coughs> there's another protein in the family that's really striking. So it's called perilipin 4. It hasn't been studied very much, but this one has a predicted amphitheater helix region of almost 1,000 amino acids in, human, in the human sequence. So it seemed like a really good candidate to study targeting to lipid droplet by uh, empathy helix. And so not only is it very long, but it's also extremely repetitive. So the sequence is composed of these 33 mere repeats. And in the human, in the human version, you can identify about, identify about 29 repeats. And here, like I'm showing you a plot. So this is an alignment of the repeats from the human protein. So you can see how in many positions of the repeats, you always have the same amino acid. And so that when you plot this, um, this uh, one repeat on a helical wheel, you can see that it, it could form a heli uh, an amphitheater helix. So it has a, oops, sorry. It has a hydrophobic side and it has a polar side. And actually it's not a very, so the, the you can see that the hydrophobic side is not very strong. So you don't have any, any large hydrophobic residues. And we can purify this, this peptides and um, look at them, the structure by CD spectroscopy. And when you look at the protein in solution, it's really, it really has this typical signature unfolded motif. But then when we increase the, the concentration of lipids in this mixture, we, we get a really nice helical signature. And this is over a 400 amino acids. Actually, we have gone up to 660 amino acids. So it's really by far the longest consecutive amphitheater helix, not amphitheater helix, any helix that we know of. So what you're saying is that it doesn't have a helical structure. No, it's That's completely unfolded in solution. And actually, this is how we purify it. So then we can ask, okay, does it go to lipid droplets? And uh, so, so we express this protein in HeLa cells fused to M cherry. And um, you can see that there's a lot of cytosolic signal, but then it also surrounds, um, surrounds lipid droplets that are here labeled in green. And the, the, the localization to lipid droplets really depends on the length of the protein. So if we have a short sequence of like thir two 33 meripeats, so 66 amino acids, it doesn't go to lipid droplets. But as we increase the, the, the length, the targeting to lipid droplets becomes really efficient. So then we can also <coughs> look at the sequence of the, of, the, of the helix to see what are the parameters that are important for targeting. And as I've told you, so it's really not a very hydrophobic helix. And so, so but it has a lot of threonine, for example. So the first thing that I wanted to ask is like, how does hydrophobicity affect targeting? So because if you imagine, so this is a helix that should interact with lipids over a long interaction surface. So we don't want to make big mutations, but instead we make small mutations and repeat them along this, the, the length of the helix. So here, for example, I make, I'm, mutating, um, I'm mutating threonines into valines or serines that are either high, more, a little bit more or a little bit less hydrophobic. And if you increase the hydrophobicity just by a little bit, now the, the helix starts to um, localize very efficiently to lipid droplets. Whereas if you decrease it by mutating three into serine, you lose all lipid droplet targeting. And then, but then another thing happens. So, okay, so if it's more hydrophobic, it goes to lipid droplets better. But you can see also that the, the cellular pool of, of, of the, the helix changes. And in fact, we can see, like, if it's more hydrophobic, it starts to invade very efficiently other cellular membranes. So here in a cell that is expressing the protein more highly, you can see very strong endoplasmic reticulum signal, but probably goes to all sorts of membranes. Whereas where you have low level expression, you see primarily lipid droplets. So from this, we can conclude that both length and hydrophobicity improve binding to lipid droplets. But in fact, if you're more hydrophobic, then you lose specificity, you become more promiscuous for other membranes. So there's something about the surface of lipid droplets that make them really sticky, so that empathy helix can bind very easily. So we wanted to understand what is that. So for that, we now do experiments in vitro with purified protein. So we can label the protein with MBD so that it's fluorescent and the fluorescence depends on um, whether it's in a hydrophobic environment and test how it binds to bilayer liposomes. So we have prepared liposomes of uh, where we vary composition um, 
for example, we increase the monon saturation of phospholipids, which, which interferes with packing of phospholipids. <coughs> we increase the charge, we increase curvature, we add the diacylglycerol. And actually, the, the wild type amphetic helix really doesn't want to bind to bilayers. Whereas if we use this mutant that has more hydrophobic, now we have very promiscuous binding to all, so all sorts of liposomes. And in fact, there was only one composition that we could find for the liposomes that was efficient to recruit this, this um, amphetic helix. And this is an uh, artificial um, um, acyl chain that you can, you can buy, like in phospholipid, that contain methyl groups. So you have methyl group every four carbons. So you can see here, so this is this diphenyl oil. So these methyl groups prevent like efficient packing of phospholipids. So again, you get a surface that is not very well packed. And um, so this surface is good for binding, to uh, for binding of our amphetic helix. But obviously, what does that have to do with lipid droplets? So one thing that, that I've told you about lipid droplets, so they don't have a bilayer, they have a monolayer. So unlike a bilayer, so in bilayer, you have the two leaflets coupled. Whereas here, like the monolayer can spread. So the phospholipids can spread on the surface. And um, this, this will increase the surface tension of the lipid droplet. So such lipid droplets are going to become unstable and they will fuse. So we thought that maybe this characteristics, uh, characteristic of the lipid droplet would be important for targeting the, of the emphatic helix. So for this, we, do like, we decided to do an extreme case experiment. So let's imagine that we have only neutral lipids and we don't have any phospholipids. What will happen? So it's a very um, crude, simple experiment. So we have, a, we have a solution of protein. We add a droplet of oil. The vortex really hard. And as you can see, as you, oh, as you increase the, 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 the concentration of protein in the solution, um, you get, after vortexing, you get increased turbidity. And if we put this mixture on, uh, under electron microscope, you can see that small droplets, small old droplets have formed. And you can also look at them by dynamic light scattering, and they have quite uniform size, so in the range of a few hundred nanometers. And if we use this in the experiment, this mutant protein that didn't go to lipid droplets in the cells, now we don't see any formation of droplets by dynamic light scattering. Um, and also we can look by, we can, we can label the protein fluorescently and look under fluorescent microscope. And you can see in the bigger droplets that you have the protein, fluorescent protein, very nicely surrounding the, the, the core of the, 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 the neutral lipid core. And so, so, so it looks like this amphetic helix can in fact replace the phospholipids. So it's acting like, a, like an emulsifier in place of phospholipids. So obviously this is a very artificial in vitro experiment. So we wanted to see like if there's evidence for any evidence for that in the cell. So for this we used um, Drosophila cells because Drosophila has been have been used a lot in screens to determine protein factors that are important for regulating the size <coughs> or the distribution of lipid droplets. And one protein that came out of these screens is this protein called CCT1, which is an enzyme that is catalyzing the rate limiting step in the synthesis of um, of phosphatidylcholine. So so the phenotype that you get when you deplete the CCT1 is that lipid droplets get bigger. And so the explanation for that is that because you don't have enough phospholipid, the lipid droplets are fusing. So if fatty helix can, can do the same thing as phospholipids, that means that we, would, we should be able to rescue the size of the lipid droplets under these conditions. And this is indeed what we see in the experiment. So here I'm showing the experiment where we deplete CCT1. And you can see that in the cells that are not expressing the protein, the lipid droplets get very big. But when we have the protein expressed, the, lip the size of the lipid droplets is rescued, which you can see quantified here compared to the control experiment. Um, so from this, we conclude that the sprelipin-4 is an amphetic helix that is really optimized for interacting with neutral lipids over a, a long surface, and it can, it can act as a coat to form these droplets. Um, and so this could be important in the cell under conditions, for example, we don't, we, when you don't have enough phospholipids, you could quickly snipe on the protein to, to stabilize lipid droplet. So I like to imagine this protein like as a, as a millipede because you have lots of legs and interacts weakly with the surface. But actually, like, I'm just going to show you one piece of data that this millipede model is really not very good. Because um, so if you go back to the, this um, mutational analysis, so one thing that I didn't talk about is the charge of amphetic helix. So in the polar side of the helix, you have quite a lot of charge residues. So actually throughout the sequence, you have the net charge is always plus one. So I have tried mutating this charge, like mutating residues to get to, to reverse the charge or to increase the charge. In all cases, we decrease the binding to lipid droplets. But one strange thing is also that the charge is always asymmetrically distributed, 
which is kind of unusual because if you want to interact with the surface, you would want to have charge close to the surface. So this is oops, the case that I'm showing you here. So, so, so we asked like, what will happen if we keep the composition the same, but we kind of redistributed the amino acids to make them as symmetrical as possible. So, so in this case, we also decrease the binding of the protein to lipid droplets. But um, we can also express these proteins in yeast, which I'm very happy about because I'm a yeast person by heart. So, um, so in yeast also it goes to lipid droplets, so these targeting mechanisms are very conserved, but actually it goes to the plasma membrane quite efficiently. And so if we, if we compare the targeting of this wild type protein and the protein that has this charge swapped, we can, we, can in, we can change the ratio between plasma membrane and lipid droplet signal, which would correlate with the, the distribution of charge. And so we, we propose that in this case, in the protein, actually the charge is mediating interhelical interactions to kind of form a meshwork on the, on the surface of the lipid droplets to stabilize them. So, um, uh, so I, I'm, uh, I, uh, this work was, I, uh, I worked as a researcher in the lab of Katie Jackson. And uh, so there, uh, sorry. Um, I have shown you work of three people. So Manuel is a PhD student and two engineers have done a lot of the experiments that I have shown you. And uh, we have done this work in collaboration with the, gr the group of Bruno and Tony. So all the liposome experiments that I have shown you in the CD spectroscopy has been done by Bruno and Marco Mani. And uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. I have some questions. Yep. So <laughs> you mentioned the changes in droplet size as a consequence of either phospholipid metabolism or the, 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 the pin expression. Are there changes to the metabolism of neutral lipids in these droplets? Do you see changes in them? I mean, cluster hydrolases, for example, are very non-specific in some way. Are there, uh, is the rate of cholesterol mobilized? So you mean when we have the infraticulics present? Yeah. We haven't done these experiments. No. We have looked a little bit if the composition would affect targeting and we see some differences. But, but yeah, that we don't know. So what do you think is the in, is function in the cell of these lipid droplets? I mean, of, I know that they are, I think that I know that they, like, ha, um, in, inside they have many lipids that maybe are sequestered, but what is the um, function of having proteins outside? Is this like a parking lot? For proteins that are supposed to be in membranes, or so so they're really important lipid droplets for lipid metabolism. So yes. one thing is like if you have too many, so for example, fatty acids are toxic, so you need to store them yeah, into no. triglycerides sure. to get them into, and then when you need energy, you recruit lipases that degrade the the triglycerides and no, the esters. The function of the some proteins getting between them and membranes. Um, of the proteins who are, which are on the lipid membrane. Uh, so you have a lot of enzymes, and then these perilipins, for example, they don't have enzymatic activity. Mm -hmm. So they have been proposed to act like as a, I mean, they can recruit other, so perilipin 1, for example, recruts lipases. So they, 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 they should so regulate. So involved in yeah. metabolism. I noticed there T47, it's, a, it's also supposedly has a role in, in protein trafficking. Um, so is the, why is it in both places? Do you have, I mean, why are there proteins in both places? Well, which are not lipid metabolism. Well, the, uh, the, the, the role of T47 in trafficking is a little bit under um, question. Investigation. Yeah, yeah. So it was originally proposed to be involved in trafficking, but actually it seems to localize really well on lipid droplets. And know, so all the function correlates with it's the... It's not contradictory. Maybe yeah. it's just, as I said, the parking lot for... Yeah, but actually, I mean, Lipid droplets are really like connected with, I mean, so they, they're connected with the endoplasmic reticulum. They have a lot of contact sites with other yeah, organelles. Okay. So they're really like an integral um, part of the cells. So you have a lot of trafficking through the lipid droplets okay. to the organelles. So maybe I missed it in, the, in <coughs> what you said, but do you, do you have a, a mechanism uh, observed or in mind whereby then the lipid droplets at some stage would get rid of the... Uh, uh so how do, how do you get the protein off? Yeah, because... Uh, yeah. We don't know. So one thing, one speculation would be that like you could <coughs> imagine by phosphorylation, because we know that if when the charge changes, mm -hmm. like it, it, it doesn't bind, and it has all this strain in serine. So you could imagine that if you sure. phosphorylate it, you could very quickly take it off, but that's completely speculation. We have no evidence I for that. So one, uh, yeah. Yeah. Is there a differentiation among the droplets? Are there 
within a cell, different kinds of different compositions, different contexts, right? Yeah. Perhaps. So it's something that's very like under study. So there are some. So for example, there is some. There are some. Some suggestions in literature that you have difference in the composition. At least in some cell types, you seem to have the difference in the composition of the core of lipid droplets, and that some perilipins prefer like cores with more triglycerides, the other one with cholesterol esters. We have tested this a little bit in yeast and we don't see a difference. And then there also you have, you have some lipid droplets, for example, that are in close contact with peroxisomes or like more in contact with endoplasmic reticulus. And there seems to be like some speciation, but this is not very well understood, but it's very um, studied a lot. All right, so thank you very much. Again, thank you.